Hey everybody, it's Dave. I'll get to the show in just a minute. Everybody's here. We're all excited to talk to our guest Joseph Klein today. But just to start off with, I want to give you a little quick public service announcement. March 31st, tomorrow as I'm recording this, is World Backup Day. I know a lot of the people that watch our show are composers and musicians, and you have very important, irreplaceable digital files on your computer. Please, please, please take a minute to back up. There are a lot of easy ways to do it. You can go to worldbackupday.com, and they've got a bunch of suggestions. If you just have your files on an external drive, and that's your primary copy, that is not a backup. You need to have two copies. Ideally, at least one of those copies should be somewhere outside your home. Um, so there are plenty of great solutions to cloud backup services, and they're not free, but they're absolutely worth it if there's a home disaster or your computer totally crashes or something horrible happens in your physical space you got to have your stuff somewhere else. So uh, I, I currently, not being paid for this, I currently use CrashPlan. I have in the past used Backblaze and Carbonite. All three of them will work great for you and will really save your butt. They have saved mine before. I almost lost my entire DMA dissertation at one point, and I had it because I had it in a cloud backup. So please take a minute this week and set up some kind of backup system, even if it's just a local backup, set up some kind of backup system for your irreplaceable scores and recordings and videos, and I promise it will be worth it at some point. All right, that's it. I will get off of my silly soapbox and on with the show. This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week we're joined by composer Joseph Klein from the University of North Texas. He is the chair of the Division of Composition Studies and distinguished teaching professor at UNT where he's taught since 1992. Composing for a host of different instrumentations, his works often make use of intermediate and theatrical elements, something I'm sure we'll be talking about later on the show today. Uh, his works have been commercially released on Innova, Crystal, Centaur, and Mark labels, so I'd say he's in some pretty good compositional company there. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, Joe. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, so you're in Texas right now. That's right. That's right. Beautiful Denton, Texas. <laughs> Wonderful. And it's not too hot for you? Uh, actually, we had a pretty cold winter, which I should not even say to people who live in the Northeast or Midwest uh, this year. But for us, I think we hit below freezing over 50 times or 60 times, which in Texas is pretty cold. So, but it's, it feels like spring out there now. So we're finally happy to have the winter over. So that's a I big anymore because I'm sure people that are in the Northeast and Midwest are just shaking their heads about oh, those Texans are so wimpy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do the same thing. I, I live in Florida, and, and these guys are all in, in – well, Patrick's in New York, and, and uh, Nate is in Michigan, and so we, we gloat to them a lot. Yeah, um, it's, it's quite pleasant. Well, you can talk to us in the summer when it's, you know, 100 sure. degrees here and then call us about right. that. But enough about know. the weather. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about some, some, some music. Um, you just had a, an album that was released, and we were just talking about this a little bit before the show, uh, Joe – that is a really interesting double disc. It's not really a double CD. It's kind of a double album. It's a CD and a DVD. Um, so it it's and it covers a long span of time. Uh, it's called Improbable Encounters. Blah. See see how quickly we get to the plug. We yeah. get to the heart of the issue here on Sound Notions. <laughs> took forever to get to the plug. I know, right? <laughs> you were just sitting around waiting. When are they going to tell people to buy my thing? Buy Joe's thing. <laughs> You can buy it everywhere. It's great. Um, so you want to tell people a, a little bit about uh, this this wide-ranging CD? Yeah, uh, it's a, lo a long-standing project. I, I had actually started working in earnest on the piece, on the album, probably around 2000 with some uh, recordings I had made with some of my soloist friends, the contrabassoonist uh, uh, Jim Rogers and uh, bass flutist Helen Bledsoe also plays an ocarina piece on there. And uh, so I was kind of thinking I was going to be putting this together, you know, for, you know, maybe 2005, 2006. And in the meantime, my friend Bill Kleinsasser at uh, Towson, uh, or Towson University, I guess it is now, in Maryland, uh, and I decided to put together an album 
with Innova together, just a kind of joint album. So that kind of took over a little bit. I put a piece on that album, Occam's Razor, and another work of this Kennedy series we'll talk about shortly for solo bass. And so that kind of derailed the, the, the solo project I was thinking about. And then all this time, I, I've been chair at the University of North Texas in the Composition Division since uh, 1999, which is a long time to be chair, although I've got a really great faculty and really great students, so it's a pretty easy gig when you have good faculty and students to work with. But unfortunately, all the administrative work just completely eats up your composition time, and so it made it very difficult not only to get this recording project going, but also just compose new pieces. So it just kind of trickled over time, and then uh, like I got a, a research grant from UNT, and I thought, okay, this is it. I'm just going to put the CD together. And in the meantime, then I look back and I've got recordings that go back into the mid-90s that I've always wanted to, to release, including some video recordings. Uh, I do a lot of works that uh, have visual elements, theatrical elements, lighting. I've got two pieces that have 5.1 sound uh, for computer music. So it really, those works were not going to be appropriate or they wouldn't be, you know, uh, adequately realized on a CD. So I, I called Philip at Innova and I said, you know, I'd like to do a DVD. Should we do an enhanced CD or something like that? He said, why don't you just do a double disc, do the video works and the 5.1 pieces on a DVD and do the audio, the, the pure audio recordings on the CD. So I thought, well, you know, not, not a big deal. And I, I wanted to make sure I didn't, you know, have to charge twice as much at Innova. If you've ever spoken with those folks over there, they are the greatest company to work for. I mean, it's a really fantastic, it's totally composer supported and everything. Yeah. And I'm sure wonderful. So he said, you can charge whatever you want for it. So I thought, okay, as long as I don't have to make it, you know, 30 bucks. I mean, nobody wants to buy a $15 CD, let alone a $30 double disc. So it's basically two for the price of one, but it allowed me to put all these old recordings on. And as a result, it kind of turned out to be a kind of retrospective because some of those pieces go back to the mid eighties and mm -hmm. uh, which it, it's, it seems a little weird. I think you should really have retrospectives when you're like 70 or 80 years old and you know, you're kind of in retirement mode and all that. But really, it was just a practical matter for me, just kind of cleaning house and getting some recordings out that I've been wanting to put out for a while. So I feel like it's a chapter closed and I can move on to some new projects for the next recording project I'm working on. So Yeah, it's good to have those things that you can point to that says this represents the stuff that I've been doing for, right. for these mm -hmm. last decades or whatever. Um, so you talked a lot about the, the intermediate stuff you have going on, and that's uh, a, an increasing trend, not just for music that is actually written with that in mind, but a lot of performers are kind of taking pieces that aren't intended to be intermedia and creating kind of a concert experience around the, the works. Can you talk a little bit about your interest in the the idea of of creating visual works uh, for, for your, own, your own compositions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you think about since the 80s, I guess, we've been much more you know, interested in visual. I mean, you think of MTV and all that, and then composers and artists and bands have to come up with a visual component or have to work with a, a right. video artist to come up with that. So I think we've gotten used to you know, 30 years of music is also has a visual component and also you know with with video games and, and films as well of course people like most of my students come in and the only music they know that's contemporary music is film music and video game music and so they everything is associated with a visual image in some way um but my and my interest in it has always been i, I used to actually started out as a as an art visual artist i mean i wasn't ever professional but it is when i was growing up that was kind of my main medium. I would paint, I would draw, and I would do things visually. And in fact, uh, when I started composing, uh, the thing I liked most about it was the graphic aspect of writing the music, of, of the notation, everything. I really was interested in that. And I read somewhere uh, later on, I teach a class on Frank Zappa here, so I'm pretty into Frank yeah. Zappa's work. And he's the same way. He said, and I, which I didn't realize until much later, that he just loved writing the notes and making the notes and putting it all together in the graphic aspect of it. So I think I've always been interested in visuals and and that kind of ties over or, or bleeds over into performance i love going to live performances and you see the one-to-one -one relation between what you know a violinist going like this and the sound you're hearing or percussionist moving around and there's that kind of you know relationship between the visual elements and the and the and the sonic elements and i like playing with that too so you might see something that visually suggests one thing but you completely tweak that and so something else comes out of that um so a lot of the works that i that I have composed that are intermediate, let's say, or use theatrical elements, play with the whole issue of performance practice and expectations and even things like, you know, uh, 
performers breaking down in the middle of performance, which you have to have certain <laughs> performers to do it because most of them don't want to look bad. So right. they have to be able to sell it and they have to be interested in creating a, a, an experience where it looks like they're, you know, having a problem or something like that. And, and in fact, in Icarus at the Cabaret Voltaire, the guitar duo, there's a section where it keeps getting t- harder and harder and harder. And one of the guitars <laughs> finally under his breast says, damn, like he has trouble playing it, which I thought, okay, at least that lets the audience know that, you know, it's intentional, I guess. The <laughs> thing about that is that, that the duo, uh, Peter Yates and Matt Elgar, got so good at that piece that it wasn't hard for them anymore. So it didn't look hard when they were playing it. <laughs> I told them I have to make another version. So it's now that you've learned that. Like a level two. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Have multiple levels for how much you played the piece. So That's so nice. there's, you know, for the, the visual aspects of my work, I, I really like the whole environment of performance. And then, of course, I've expanded that with video and lighting and, uh, you know, kind of other extraneous theatrical elements over the years, which some of that you can find in the in the DVD. Yeah, I really that idea of expectation uh, reminds me of uh, the the Barrio trombone sequenza, where because it's such a large pointed instrument that when when they give a thing, it look it something is definitely about to happen. Right. right, and there's some instruments, and you pointed out several of them that are like that trombone. It's like that where you can really clearly see things are moving, and and string instruments and percussion instruments, and you know big shifts of piano register. And right. I, when I write music, I think about those things a lot as well. Like I, I, I oftentimes will write something almost not even because I want the sound, but because I, I want the, the saxophone player, because I know when this, this particular person that I'm writing for does this particular thing, they do this, like, with their shoulder. <laughs> and uh, well, that, we, was, we that was something, the... by the way, for only the visual, pe- the people watching the video version of our show, and those of you that are just listening to audio will just have to use your imagination. Uh, <laughs> it goes more to... than that for the trombone sequence, though. Um, you know, some people go all out with the clown costume. Yeah, with the clown suit and, and you know, Stockhausen, of course. With, the, oh, with yeah, everything, yeah. but <laughs> with, everything. with almost literally everything, pretty much, yeah. It's um, uh, yeah. So if you're throwing helicopters in your pieces, you know you've pretty much gone to the right. Extreme. You've run out, right? That's <laughs> the end. You've gotten to the end of the not yet created internet. Yeah. If you're putting <laughs> helicopters in your in your pieces, right? Um. So I think it's it, so you you mentioned the euphonium thing very briefly. Can yeah. you can you explain for people that have not seen this euphonium creation? Well, there, there's what's a, going on. Yeah, there's a there's a kind of a multiple backstory to this because it, just to give you a little bit of background on the piece, it's it's Goblin Market, uh, the the long poem by Christina Rossetti, the pre-Raphaelite poet from the 19th century, and my friend Bill Boots, whom I've written some pieces for before and worked with in a group called Tales and Scales, which is this you know children's music telling troupe in Evansville. Uh, Bill hasn't been with them for many years, but he was kind of the main character. And he just loves theatrical work. So, And, of course, he plays trombone. It's a very theatrical, inherently theatrical instrument. But Bill likes to go even be- beyond that, stomping around. And every time they do a music storytelling, he'd play the monster or whatever. So he was always the guy moving around and you know, kind of using his instrument as an extension of his body. Um, so he asked me for this piece, and frankly, I, I didn't care for the poem that much. I'm not a huge pre-Raphaelite fan, and I didn't, you know... It didn't do much for me, so I think he thought there was going to be a you know singer or a narrator or something going on with the, and I just thought I want to do a really abstract version of this, and I want to basically set it in a kind of metaphorical way for a trombone and essentially prepared piano. It's it's not really so much prepared, but the pianist plays completely inside the piano with bow and with uh, plectra and with music boxes, and there's all kinds of stuff. The video actually gets to show a lot of things in the piano that you can't really see in a performance so well. Um, That's one cool thing about those videos is you get to see a lot of things that you wouldn't really see very clearly from the audience. Exactly. And I wanted to try to play that up, but, you know, take advantage of the fact that you could stick the video camera in the piano or you could go right up to the euphonium player with all those tubes sticking out of it. So, So getting to that part of it, Part of the story, if you know the listeners know the story, it's a these two sisters and they they're just frolicking out. You know, very nineteenth century, they're frolicking out in the woods and they live out there. It doesn't really say much about their life, but they the one sister runs into these goblin men and they're selling these fruits and it's she's very enticed by the fruits and it's a very sexual reference and you know she's drawn to these goblin men and she finally you know buys their fruits and they smear fruit all over. And of course, it's very erotic and the way it's presented, it's almost like a kind of a rape scene in this in this poem. And so, uh, of course, it's done in a very, you know, 19th century pre-Raphaelite way. But I thought, okay, there's a kind of violation going on here. 
so the section in the piece that, you know, this very abstract uh, interpretation that I do with the uh, trombone and piano, I thought, okay, I'm going to use an instrument. I'm going to violate this instrument. And, and, and trombonists often get called upon to play euphonium and they usually hate euphonium. I have yeah. played euphonium a lot, but trombonists, I you know, talk to them, it's like, oh God, I hate having to play euphonium, but I'll do it if they need one. There's no euphonium play around in orchestra. If they ever have to double, they'll, you know, you'll frequently find trombonists doing that. Right. Or if they're in band, it's like, oh, we don't have enough euphonium players. This trombone player can go over there and play the euphonium. So I know there's already a kind of history among trombonists and the euphonium. So I thought, okay, if they're going to play this thing, we're going to just desecrate the hell out of it, you know? So we pull all the valve slides out and stick these, uh, like, surgical tubing in there, and they just, they run, like, 10 feet in every direction. And at the end of each of those tubes, there's some kind of a wind, uh, pr wind produced noisemaker, like a police whistle or a siren or a duck call. One tube just goes in a bucket of water. That Bill came up with that one. And That's so it's, it's like an octopus. If you see this thing, this euphonium with these tubes sticking out of it, going in all different directions with noisemakers at the end, so that every time you push a different valve down, it sends air to a different tube into a different noisemaker. Of course, you can combine tubes and you can go back and forth. So the sound is moving all over the hall too because these tubes are everywhere. And it's this absurd sounding calliope kind of weird euphonium. And on top of that, I thought, that's just not enough to desecrate it like that. Let's wrap it in Christmas lights that are flashing and red, you know? So it's just this absurd, surrealist, you know, interlude. It's actually an improvisation between the the euphonium and the pianist who's actually only reading text at that point. It's the only place in the entire 22 minute piece where you actually, the text is actually read, but it's read in a microphone and completely distorted, uh, you know, with, with effects processing and everything. So you can't really understand what the text is. Little snippets yeah. come out. So I kind of desecrated the text in that point too. Right. So violation everywhere in that piece. So. <laughs> right. Well, you know, we've been talking about it really specifically. Maybe we should just play a little clip of it right here. We normally don't do that until the end, but this is, I think, totally a good place to play it. Uh, this is probably mostly in the in the third excerpt that you sent me. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. The third. Okay. So this is this is a, a little excerpt um, from tw toward oh. the the end, I would say, of uh, of Goblin Market. This is a uh, 1993 by our guest Joseph Klein. Thank <laughs> you. 
So that was an excerpt from Goblin Market by our guest, Joseph Klein, performed by uh, William Boots on trombone and re- euphonium you saw in there. You very much saw, if you're watching the video. Uh, and uh, who's the pianist? I know I had it on the screen, but I want to say it too. Um, oh, sorry. I, I turned you down. I can't hear you. Uh, yeah. Sorry. You're Douglas Reed is the piano player. Who? Douglas, Douglas Reed. Douglas Reed. Thank you. Um, so it, uh, was a wonderful performance. I cannot, so you had to really find somebody that would be willing to do something like that. Well, <laughs> Bill is the kind of guy that it's like, just bring it on. You know, I mean, you know, he was wanting to, to, you know, he said, just make it as theatrical as you can. So there was like not a single thing in the, the, that I did that he was even balking about. I mean, there's one place in there where he has to play really high on the alto trombone, lying on his side on the floor, which is not easy to do. I mean, hard, yeah. hard enough to play on an alto trombone and then to play high on the alto trombone than to play lying down. He was totally game. And I mean, he, he's been doing the piece now for, well, almost 20 years. And he still gets on the floor and does that, squats in the corner and plays. All. The big challenge actually was the pianist because uh, we didn't know who he was going to use for piano. And he had a few colleagues at the... University of Evansville, and the, and the one woman, uh, and I regret I don't remember her name, it was so long ago, she, he was going to have her play, and she uh, got pregnant at the time, like, when the performance was going to be, it would be really hard for her to play some little inside piano things, and of course she was taking some leave of absence for maternity leave and all, so he asked Doug Reed, who was the organ professor there, and I thought, oh, gee, organist, they're not going to want to do this, they're not going to play inside the piano and speak and all that, and Doug was just as game as Bill. I mean, there was nothing that Doug wouldn't do either. And to, he was so, I remember the first time we did the performance and I went to Evansville for it, Doug had this box full of all the paraphernalia he was going to use at the piano. And he'd been looking for the right balloons that worked a certain way and the right string for the, you know, the bow hair and all that. So as soon as I saw that, I thought, okay, this guy is definitely made for this piece. And you know, yeah. the two of them have been doing it for almost 20 years. And I, we've done it only one time without Doug. And I actually played the piano part, and we had someone else do. Usually, I'm running the the sound, but somebody else did the sound, and I ran the piano part. Which I found out after doing that, it's really hard on your back because you're standing up with a pedal down and leaning into the piano the whole time. And 20 minutes of that, I feel yeah. bad for Doug. He's never complained about his back, but I, after that one time I did it, it was just man, I need to do something about that. I guess. So. <laughs> Has but anyone ever just, attempted the for, trombone part? For, I'm, I'm sorry. Has anyone else ever attempted the trombone part? Yeah, um, Andrew Glendening, a friend of mine, uh, at uh, he's actually uh, at the uh, U- or University of Redlands in California now. Uh, he's uh, director of the music department there. He played it uh, once. That was not long after it was written, um, and he did it when he was at uh, Moorhead State University in Kentucky. So he's the only other one, though. Um, it's just not for the faint of heart that piece, right. you know, because all the stuff, the demands. You got to play alto trombone. You got to play tenor trombone. You got to play this euphonium. You got to lie on the floor. You got to squat. You got to yell. You got to take your instrument apart. Um, and 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 uh, also the parts are intentionally. There's there's one movement actually the third movement where it starts out at the top of the tenor trombone range. In fact, even beyond the tenor range. So the early notes are just X's, just you know high as possible. Try to fake them, and then it goes down into the bottom into the pedal tones. And there's notes that don't exist on the instrument down there either. So. The trombonist has to actually fake notes on both ends of the instrument, uh, in addition to all the other stuff that's the real notes they have to play. So, <laughs> that's amazing. Joe, let me let me ask you. I mean, um, I I, I want to know more about the inception of of this work specifically, and works in and and other works that um, use components like this. I mean, if you have you seen Laurie Anderson's United the States, mm-hmm. um, and I I so I'm I'm just wondering like. If, have these have these sort of works that have come come before this work specifically have acted as influences for you to write works in this kind of intermedia platform? Yeah, you know, it's I, I, the the guitar piece actually that's on there is also on the video. It was done at Gadi Almas Music Week in '88, and I remember I was just my first year as a doctoral student in Indiana when I went there. And you know, the one thing about Gadi Almas, you get a great performance. You get to hear a lot of really interesting composers and some interesting performers. And the, uh, a lot of the, the, the reviewers made some comment about it being like Coggle. My, my guitar piece had a lot of mm-hmm. Coggle influence, Maurizio Coggle. And I heard of Coggle, but I never really had listened to his music before. So this guy thought, well, you know, if they're making these references, I should probably find out what this guy's music is like. And so <laughs> I really got into Coggle, and it became a kind of feedback loop. And, of course, you know, growing up in the 80s or you know, being in college in the 80s, I heard a lot of Laurie Anderson and, and seen some performance of hers uh, live. She came to Indiana once, and we saw an interesting performance with her. So, you know, it's 
you know, that all was kind of in my mind. And of course, you see a lot of things, you know, with video works in the 80s. And um, I, I think that I'm, I'm aware of those things. And I'm kind of like, in, I don't know if I'd say directly influenced, but you definitely see things and think, you know, I have a different take on it, but I really like that idea of, of integrating the visual and the audio and mm -hmm. creating a full experience out of it rather than just, it's just a, you know, it's just a sonic experience. Right, right. The, it's, I, so uh, the one thing that I think is, is really interesting about that is that a lot of the people that are working in this space are using electronics to do these things. Mm -hmm. And you do have electronics in the sounds of what we were listening to, but most of the stuff that you're doing visually is just people right. and it's a, a performer moving around and e even the the prepared euphonium thing where you've got the tubes going everywhere reminds me a lot of and i don't know if this it really comes across in in the video recording as as well as it would in a space with those things placed around the room but that strikes me as as a remote control thing that you would do with an electronic controller that a musician would have that would control a multi-channel crazy setup thing and you i mean it's not that it isn't a crazy setup because it's a really crazy <laughs> setup but i I'm, I'm curious about how you you balance because there is electronics with the, the the electronic stuff with the um the stuff that you're asking people to do yeah that's actually a really good question and it's actually something i thought about because there's a kind of low tech aspect of this you know and i think it's delightful that's since you're right the remote control i mean he's using those valves on the on the euphonium like a remote control and pushing these buttons and they activate these different sounds which it's like is a steampunk good. thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean it's, i never thought about it but it's some kind it's of connection a, there it's an incredible machine you've built yeah yeah right but i mean it's very much like uh like a max patch and you're just triggering a you know a, a file or something i mean you're just triggering these different sounds i actually went one step further my friend butch rovan who's now at the on the faculty at Brown University, he used to be uh, at UNT for a few years in the early 2000s. And before he left, we did a concert together where we were both improvising on a bunch of found instruments and uh, just different kinds of objects. I was using pop rocks and cola, and we had them hot, so it mic'd you know, really closely. And we use our 16-channel space we have in the Merrill Ellis Theater here at UNT to be able to spatialize all this stuff. But what we were doing at these tables was completely low-tech analog stuff. We were just amplifying them. And I actually did a kind of version of the uh, euphonium, but I had two trumpets uh, that I put together and I had one of the, the, the valve slide, same thing with the tubes and one of the, like the third valve slide on the trumpet went to the second trumpet lead pipe. And so I could activate that one. <laughs> if I push the third valve, I could actually activate this one. And each of those tubes from those valves went to a different uh, place on the table, which had a different mic. And each of those mics was to a different speaker. So not only <laughs> were you getting all these different sounds coming out of this trumpet, but every time I push a button, it would come out of a different speaker in a different part of the space. So it's completely – so it's kind of combining the technical ability of, of being able to spatialize sound with microphones and technology with a completely low-tech mechanical – you know, the tubes of a trumpet yeah. and, and, and pipes. And I, I, I found that very amusing that, you know, you had this on one end kind of primitive mechanical device. Well, trumpet's not primitive at all, but the way I was using it was pretty primitive. And then you've got this high tech thing where you're, you know, spatializing sound. So I just found that kind of it amused me. I just, you know, and I think things that amuse me, I hope amuse other people as well. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you even call that? Because I know like there's electroacoustic music where you might have some electronics interacting with acoustic elements, but this is like mechanical spatialization <laughs> acoustic yeah. music or something. Yeah, and, and part of it's because Butch Rovan likes a lot of low tech things. He actually one of the, the we both came up with our own sound making devices we just figured okay we're going to improvise together and we knew it was sounds we we're going to be using but we each came up with our different ones and butch loves playing with old edison phonographs you know um, cylinder phonographs and so he had an old edison machine and he was playing around with that and the wax cylinder and all and and a lot of wind up kind of devices and so you know he was using a lot of low tech things as well that were actually re amplifying and sending around the space but and, and there's something very charming about seeing a table full of just crap you know <laughs> <laughs> it's a, kind of let's, let's, let's coin it neo analog. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like that that. Uh, Auger, you know, like like found objects. It was kind of like that. On a table. It's right. Kind yeah. of <laughs> I mean that's what that's what electronic music is. You go to you go to a live electronics thing, the the first <laughs> thing that the, the, the DJ or the whoever's performing the electronics 
sets up is their folding table from Target, right? <laughs> right. That they're going to put all the stuff on. And my, Nate, Nate is an expert in in this sort of performance, <laughs> right? Yeah, and then there's the the pile of little things, little electronic components, maybe a, a toy doll or something that's yeah. been hacked, and then the spaghetti of wires mixed, mixed all over the place. Like circuit bending and all that kind of stuff, so you've got all these kind of low-tech objects that you're doing circuit bending. Alligator yeah. clips. And, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> And it's, Two it's, or three it's, things don't work, and then you have to <laughs> improvise to make a solution. Yeah, it's really quite beautiful. Not just the sounds, but just the the. the I mean, if, if you could see it up close, and for those, you know, if you're performing, you're you're aware of it. But for a lot of people that are in the audience, if they're at a distance, they can't see the kind of visual beauty of all that kind of junk on the table that you're making sound with. You know, I, I think there's something really beautiful about that. But I think yeah. that that kind of gauche over the top thing is is really a, a, a fun thing to play with and you certainly did that with the christmas lights on the euphonium which we didn't really talk about but there are things that are preparing the euphonium that don't really make sound right right yeah and, and i don't know if you could see from the video but there's also two strobe lights that are out of phase with each other so if you're in the hall i think you see it a lot better because you get not only the video the uh, christmas lights flashing at a certain rate but then you have these two strobe lights flashing at different rates, so you have this kind of phasing going on. So it becomes, and then you've got all the random kind of effects processing going on in the in the spoken part of the piano. It becomes this very surreal and actually kind of disturbing environment when you're in the middle of it in the hall. It, it's it's pretty disturbing because it's loud and it's you've got the kind of noise elements coming out of the euphonium and the noise coming from the technology of the piano uh, spoken part, and then all these lights. So uh, yeah, I mean, in that case, I think it's. There's a kind of humor to the absurdity of the prepared euphonium, but it, the result of all those things together is a little bit dark, dark and ominous. I mean, it's the it's essentially the rape scene of the of the of the poem. So I mean, it's a pretty dark uh, uh, topic in there. Yeah, well, and it's the sensory overload of a rock show, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's true. It's kind of like a very abstract rock show. But yeah, you're right. It's like just it's over the top. And for a, a concert space where you would imagine this is done on a recital with traditional piano and trombone pieces or something like that and then you might end with this piece suddenly it's completely over the top when you compare it you know you put it in the context of a, a standard recital right. yeah what were you gonna say nate well two things i, I was gonna say yeah like even just experiencing it as, as a video a little video on my screen i was a little bit disturbed in that section for sure yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh i was wondering with the so with the live electronics on the vocals, what what exactly is going on there? It, it seems like it's live processing. Yeah, yeah. It's basically I had a bunch of presets uh, and just went through them, these various patches, and I just went through the presets kind of, wasn't exactly randomly, but there's a kind of, in the performance, you're supposed to have a kind of, I, I'm really into numerical systems and processes and kind of okay. proportions and things like that. So I kind of worked out a series of proportions in there. So there's all this mathematical stuff going on in there as well. And actually yeah. throughout the whole piece, but that's only for me to organize the material and to think about balancing the material, but it's not really necessary. I, I'm hoping that when an audience sees it, they're not thinking about the proportional relationships between the different effects. They're really kind of taking on the whole experience. Yeah. Um, but those things are there as well as part of an element of the piece. Right. Well, there's there's a lot of incentive, I think, to take on that whole experience and not focus on those little nitpicky things because you've given such a rich experience in, in all those different relationships. I mentioned the rock show thing, and actually I thought about this. You should check out um, – there was, a, there was a, a few stories written toward the end of last year about the weirdness of Kanye West's live show that he was touring with. Like he had a bunch of really strange abstract things that he was doing in a like super mainstream – tour um the yeezus tour yeah this is the yeezus tour so uh, check it out i'll check it out definitely um I, 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 aren't the, I haven't way. listened to that album but it's uh, good aren't they're supposed to be isn't aren't the lyrics supposed to be very like the lyrics are awful the production is wonderful <laughs> oh, okay, okay. This, is, okay. this is pop right? <laughs> <laughs> it's this, this is the one this is the famous uh uh in a french ass restaurant hurry up with my damn croissants is one of the lyrics <laughs> <laughs> um it's real it's really bad but yeah. the uh the sounds are really interesting so yeah especially considering the the source yeah, um yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I wanted to talk about one more thing that's on this disc. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about Goblin Market, and that's fine because it's great. Um, yeah. But the CD 
has uh, something that you, you pointed out in, in conversation in an email to me, Joe. Uh, this Pathways work that's on here is kind of a chamber concerto. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has to do with space in a way that I think almost relates to the sorts of things we were talking about with Goblin Market. Um, this is a concerto, but it takes many different forms. You can view it from different perspectives with different instrumental soloists. So in lieu of me screwing up the explanation of what Pathways is, um, could you maybe just explain briefly what, what what's going on there? Yeah. Okay, I'll give you the... I'll start out with the practical aspect of this and, and, and how it came to be, uh, which is probably not as... Uh, it'd probably be better if I said, oh, I was thinking about this and I had this conceptual idea and it came about. But sometimes the most interesting ideas come about out of practical matters or just, you know, I kind totally of brace, agree. Brace, try to solve a problem, right? Yeah. And so just to kind of go back a ways, actually this trombonist friend of mine, Andrew Glendenning, the one I mentioned is at the University of Redlands that had played Goblin Market in addition to Bill Boots, he actually was, you know, kind of the main, uh, uh, I guess, in- inspiration for a lot of composers in Indiana. We were there. He commissioned everybody there. The, all, like, all the composers I knew had written a piece for Andrew at one time. I wrote a trombone quartet for him. Uh, and uh, later I wrote a brass quintet for him after Indiana. But um, this concerto came about. We were uh, we both graduated, and it's just kind of funny. This is kind of talk about what a couple of music geeks we are. You know, we're, I was the best man at his wedding in 92. It was right before I came to UNT. In fact, I was on my way to Denton. And uh, it was he was uh, married just uh, in, in Massachusetts, uh, the south of Boston. So we went out there. My wife, my son, was eight months old at the time. So, and we're at the bachelor party, and you know how bachelor parties are supposed to be with all kinds of debauchery and drinking and all this kind of stuff. Well, my memory of that bachelor party was was Andrew and I talking, brainstorming this idea for concerto. It's like I really want a concerto for trombone and, and orchestra, and you know I had some ideas about it, and I really want to do it. And I've got some opportunities to work with some of these ensembles and. So that tells you how geeky we were. You know, we're, we're talking about this rather than, you know, doing we're supposed to do it at a bachelor party, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I really would love to write a piece for him because he's such a great trombone player and a real technician. And um, but I didn't really have an opportunity. And I thought, OK, you know, this, at the same time, there was a, 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 a deadline coming up for the. American Composers Forum, which at that time was the Minnesota Composers Forum, you might remember. Um, and th- it was for the Composer Commissioning Program, the CCP program. And if you were a non-Minnesota composer, you had to write for a Minnesota ensemble or Minnesota performer. It had to be performed in Minnesota. If you were from Minnesota, you could write for anybody. So I thought, okay, well, it'd be kind of interesting if I, I – and I knew one – performer up in in, uh, in Minnesota was a percussionist, and I, I called him, although we never really worked that much together in Indiana, and, and called him and said, you know, I'm thinking of writing this percussion concerto, would you be interested? And he said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. But my idea was, and this is what came to the proposal, like, what if I write a piece where the orchestra part is exactly the same, but that the solo parts are completely different? So you create this kind of fixed landscape of the orchestra for like 20 minutes of an orchestra piece that becomes this kind of monolithic you know, like un- unchanging thing, and that the soloists, the various soloists, are like travelers that go through this landscape, and each of them, you know, perceive it in a different way, and interpret it in a different way, and react to it in a different way. And so the the, the first version was the percussion version, and, and this this friend of mine, Dan Hostetler, played played uh, drum set a lot. So I wrote this kind of mega drum set percussion solo with this. But the main thing I was writing it for was to write a trombone concerto for Andrew Glendening. So the next version was the trombone. In fact, I think I wrote the trombone version first, come to think of it, because I really wanted to do that. And he already had performances lined up and everything. Um, and then the, a couple years later, I wrote a saxophone version for my colleague Eric Nessler here at UNT. So right now there are three versions, one for solo percussion, one for uh, trombone, and one for uh, soprano sax. And um, the trombone and the sax versions were played pretty early on, the trombone first and then the sax version a year later. And just a couple weeks ago here at UNT, I put on a program of my work, which included the uh, saxophone version of Pathways with actually Eric Nessler's doctoral, one of his doctoral students, Kyle Steck, played the solo part. And then I... And that's on YouTube. People should check that out. And I'll make sure you put those uh, yeah. links up there. And my percussion colleague here, Chris Dean, who's also on the CD, he's playing the the uh, solo percussion piece, there's Stern Clara on the CD. Uh, and um, he wanted to play the solo percussion part. So that was actually the premiere almost 20 years after I wrote it 
finally got the thing premiered. It was the first time I got to hear the, and I was actually hoping I still liked the piece. You know, I knew I had already tweaked and fine tuned the percussion or the uh, saxophone and trombone version, but you know, I hadn't really touched the trom the percussion version in 20 years. And you know, it's kind of scary pulling out a 20 year old piece and thinking, I hope I still like this piece. Well, yeah. <laughs> he played the hell out of it and it sounded great. We made a few little tweaks, but uh, I was happy with it, thankfully. But it, it does create some interesting challenges because, and you know, we played the two different versions and the orchestra hears totally different sound coming from the two different soloists. And as a conductor, I have to react very differently. So it was a very challenging thing for me as a conductor to have to adjust to the two different soloists while the orchestra's playing the exact same thing. So that was kind of, I never thought about the problems there, but that's definitely something to think about. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting concept, and I, I, I've only heard the saxophone version, so I can only guess as to, to what the, the trombone and the percussion versions sound like. Um, how similar are the parts? It's, I mean, obvi obviously, when you're moving from percussion to a melody instrument, you you can't just kind of hit the transpose button right. in the computer and and make it work. Uh, but I'm curious as to how similar the the solo melody parts are. Well, that that that's actually was was the intention was to how different can I possibly make them? And those yeah. are very different instruments. And particularly if you're talking about a drum set, which is all non pitched percussion. I didn't have any pitch percussion in there. It's totally different than dealing with a saxophone, which can play very quickly and, you know, really light and, and agilely. And a trombone, which is a very totally different set of, you know, sound properties. And, you know, of course, the trombone, I'm playing a lot of with the glissandos and the mute changes and a lot of sustained tones and transformations of timbre. And the saxophone, I'm playing with a lot of figuration. And the percussion is just a, a very heavily rhythmic and timbral kind of experience. And, and the, the challenge of writing the piece was that when I composed the orchestra part, um, my intention was to completely ignore or disregard what possible uh, solo parts would, would be doing. I mean, I knew there was going to be a percussion and a trombone part from the beginning, but when I wrote the orchestra part, I had to really not think about what those instruments would play because I didn't want them influencing the orchestra, which is completely anathema to what most people, you write a concerto. How you write a concerto, right. Between yeah. the solos and the orchestra. So I'm having to look at it like I have to create this thing that's completely unaffected by the solo parts and then have the solo part weave in and out of the orchestra in different ways. And, and in fact, the subtitles of the pieces suggest the different characters of the instrument. So the pathways for saxophone is called interior shadows, pathways, interior shadows. So the saxophone reflects a lot of things that's going on in the orchestra. It kind of weaves in and out of the wind parts and it plays a lot of the same material kind of in an echo, but you know, that's a little simplified, but you know, it's 20 minutes. It does a lot of different things, but that was kind of my idea was a saxophone was going to be a kind of shadow of the orchestra. The trombone uh, pathways is called opposing forces. So there's a sense of opposition between these two uh, instruments. So the, or the, the uh, trombone is constantly battling the orchestra. There's a kind of uh, give and take with the orchestra and the trombone. And they tend to be doing opposite kinds of things. Uh, the percussion was uh, Pathways Revolution is the subtitle of that. And that actually was, was a, uh, I, I grew up in Los Angeles. And so at the time this was uh, pr proposed, the L.A. riots just happened after the Rodney King decision, you know, and the, the all the issues that happened with the you know uprising in, in Los Angeles. So I was seeing, you know, regular video images on CNN about parts of L.A. being burned and people getting beaten and looting and all that kind of stuff. So that was in my mind when I wrote the percussion version. And I thought about it being like the percussionist is in revolt. It's basically revolting against this fixed orchestra. So there's a lot of confrontational elements in the percussion part. So just even conceptually, those three different instruments have a completely different approach to them in relationship to the orchestra. And so part of my job as a composer was trying to figure out how to make those things connect without doing anything to the orchestra part. Yeah, and, and it, it strikes me that even when you describe those relationships, you're describing very visual things, even though it's, it's not kind of the deliberate visual thing that uh, Goblin Market is. Um, though, as we said earlier, an instrument, especially the trombone and percussion, especially a, a drum set where you're, you're right. used to watching crazy things on drum set and rock bands, um, is, is a very visual thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it's interesting that you're, you're thinking so visually, even when it's not a, an explicitly visual performance. Right. Um, so and I'll, I'll tell you if you if you listen to the two links, you can actually you know hear them or see them side by side. And even people at the concert that read the program notes where it said these are exactly the same orchestra, I had people coming up to me and said I could I could recognize certain elements in there that were familiar, but it sounded so completely different with the different soloists. It just it's so funny how it completely 
puts the orchestra in a completely different light when you have a, a, a entirely different solo part going on. And even the people that knew the orchestra parts were the same had a lot of trouble hearing the similarities. Are the players uh, literally reading the same music for both of these, or are there like special indications or something? Okay, there are two places. Well, there's actually three spots that that were different in this. Well, first of all, the the percussion version is actually in four movements. So even this landscape, this kind of you know monolithic landscape, huh. divides up in different ways for the different solo parts. So <laughs> the the trombone and the sax versions are in three movements. The tr the percussion divides the piece into four chunks. So and it's kind of complicated the way everything kind of works together because I have this very uh, complex systematic approach to how I'm using the instruments and how I'm using uh, like dynamics and, and register and all this that kind of create this landscape. But the, the three parts that are were altered in the, in the, besides the fact that the movements are divided differently, there was a, uh, in the trombone version, there's a uh, cadenza at the very beginning of the, of the piece that starts before the orchestra comes in. So they have a fermata bar at the beginning, but in the, both the percussion and sax version, I just told him, just cross that bar out because we're going to start on measure two for you and go from there. Um, then there's also at the end of what's the first movement in all, in, in all three pieces, there's a section where the orchestra goes into these loops. It's kind of like uh, these, they, they play these patterns, these kind of uh, clock patterns like Ligeti, and they keep cycling with each other. And then it gets into this cycle of, of I think it's like 13 beats, and then it gets in a cycle of seven beats, and it gets in a cycle of three beats. Kind of like, like, uh, going towards a black hole and kind of getting sucked right. into it gradually like that. So these patterns keep getting shorter and shorter. And that uh, passage that repeats has a different number of repeats for the trombone version and for the percussion version and for the sax version. So I had to tell them, okay, in the sax version, we're doing this three times and then five times to the next measure and then seven times. And in the percussion version, we're going to do this way. So they had to mark that up in the score. And the third thing was the there's a cadenza that's between what's actually the third and fourth movement in the percussion part, but it's in the middle of the third movement for the sax part. Um, and that's between the, the soloist and the bass drum. There's this bass drum that just is these detonations in the back. And there's like seven really like fortissimo blows that come from the bass drum. And if you, that's the part that everyone recognized because when you hear the bass drum beating the hell out of the instrument, you definitely, that stands out in an orchestra. Piece. Right. Sure. And the dialogue in the saxophone, it's a, it's a, like a switch. So the saxophone plays this very rapid figuration, and every time the bass drum hits, it shuts the saxophone off and then turns it back on again, and it shuts <laughs> it off again, like the switch going back and forth. In the, in the percussion version, it's a dialogue between the two because you've got all these drums, and the, bass dr or the uh, drum soloist is actually playing two bass drums. So he's got two kick drums, and there's this thing between the kick drums and the bass drum in the back, so there's a whole dialogue that goes on there where they're more conversational rather than like the percussionist or the drummer acting like a switch in the sax version. So those are three cases where the orchestra has to write something a little different in their part. Yeah. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. That's really cool. I, 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 I think the, this concept is really fascinating. I would love to sometime see like a marathon performance of like 10 versions of this piece. <laughs> I still want to write two more. I, I want to write one for piano and one for violin because I figure I want a brass, woodwind, string... Uh, percussion piano so then i'll be done but yeah you know. i would think i guess that's true because the temptation of writing a, like a, a saxophone and a clarinet or a, a trombone and a trumpet would be to to make them very similar and right. i think making them so different perhaps a vocal one that's true mm -hmm. be a vocal one my wife's a singer she'd love doing that probably there you go. <laughs> i put her through her paces before <laughs> go the full hindemit bill right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, and uh, so I understand you've had some other premieres recently, just like last week, you, uh, as well. And congratulations right. with those. Well, thank you. I, yeah, this is actually I'm I'm really happy to say that I'm I'm kind of out of my I don't know if I call it a slump. It's just that uh, I just didn't have any time being chair and all the stuff that you know my chairmanships and you know for the last several years I've been on nine committees a year and you know chairing two or three of them and it just you know, it eats your lunch to having to chair committees. So I finally extricated myself from some of this committee work and have been able to do some more composing. And so this last uh, concert was uh, in addition to the the old percussion uh, so pathways concerto that was premiered. The piccolo piece was premiered, which, and that's on the CD, but we did the recording before she had done the performance. So it was kind of interesting to have the recording come out before the actual piece was premiered. Yeah. But then the other piece that's a more large scale one that's been occupying my time in the last uh, year and a half, and we'll probably do so for the next couple of years, is a large-scale uh, modular uh, piece called An Unaware Cosmos. It's just these various 
small modules for anything from a duo to uh, orchestra, an orchestra. And my idea is that these will be modular in the sense that they can interrupt each other in different ways. They can be recombined. They can be broken apart. And uh, if you see the video on the concert, you'll see there's three modules from this. And the one module is for viola and piano. The other module is for trumpet trombone. I'm sorry, trumpet bass trombone percussion and piano, and the other modules for four uh, upright basses. So there are three very different kinds of ensembles with very different kinds of music. And uh, But the idea being that this would be just be one of many different ways that these and other uh, modules could be combined. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be my next Innova project. I told uh, Philip Blackburn, he asked me, what's your next project? I said, I already know what it is because I'm working on the pieces right now. So nice. it'll be brand new. It won't be 30 years old music I'm putting on there. So <laughs> <laughs> Refreshing, I imagine, yeah. yeah. And you, you had a, a new piece at NASA just the past weekend. So. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, thank you for mentioning it. I, I uh, didn't know you guys knew about that. That was, uh, it came up from uh, uh, Greg Dewhurst, who's a saxophonist in the area, and his wife, uh, Kristen, is a flutist, and it's a trio for saxophone, flute, and and percussion, and uh, it's actually another kind of visual setup because there's a the sax plays soprano and tenor sax, and the flute plays flute and piccolo, and the percussion is in three different stations, and so each of the trios they're in a different configuration on stage, and then there's uh, these solos that are in between there for each of the wind instruments, and so the solos are kind of where they move from one station to the other. There's a solo uh, kind of an interlude being played. So again, it's it's about an 18 minute piece, and it's another piece that's a very visual theatrical kind of a of work, but he just premiered it. I haven't heard, I guess the recording didn't come out, so we're going to be doing it in, uh, in in Fort Worth in April, so I'll get to hear it then. So. should have told me I'd have brought my Zoom recorder. I was, I was there at the conference. Were you there? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it was one of like eight or nine things happening. Simon's right. Movie. That's the thing. Like unbelievable. That that conference is amazing. It's gotten so big. It's, yeah. they, I, I, I was at part of the, the general membership meeting, which... Mm -hmm is super weird and I probably shouldn't have done, but um, <laughs> they were saying that they had basically doubled the size of their membership since the previous NASA biennial. Wow. Uh, and they anticipate continuing to grow. So things are changing for NASA in a big way. Um, and if you're a composer, by the way, I, you should definitely, first of all, definitely be writing for saxophone. And second of all, uh, when you do write for saxophone, bring those works to the NASA conference because it is a really interesting, basically an interesting new music conference. Yeah. Yes. And saxophonists love new music. And so if you get a piece played at a NASA conference, there's going to be a dozen saxophonists immediately. They're going to want to play that piece probably. Ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Actually, Great. I that the saxophone version of Pathways uh, was premiered here at the NASA conference at UNT in 95. So that was actually the premiere of that piece was at NASA. And, you know, there's you know hundreds of saxophone players hearing that so but that's yeah. a pretty daunting piece to play to get a 25 piece chamber orchestra together not as easy to do as a trio or a duo right sure right but uh yeah it was it's a it's a great conference and you should you should go the the they're very nice people and they want to play your music so yeah yeah what, what I love could be better? they're great friends of ours yeah yes uh p play our music please is what we're saying <laughs> <Exactly>. um <laughs> As, as this conversation, I, I could we could continue talking for a very long time, but I did want to mention a few other things that we had uh, from the news uh, this week. Um, there is Nate. I will let you talk about the viola because <laughs> we don't get to talk about the viola quite enough here on Sound Notion. Well, uh, what what I understand is that the uh, it's officially the best viola, from what I understand. Officially. It's, <laughs> officially from the officials is <laughs> right. that what we're going with from the governing body of violadom <laughs> well it's it's for sale and it's it's going to be uh it's a stradivarius bid. viola oh right yeah. and it's it's being bid upon in, in a uh I, I don't remember what the term was but the <laughs> anyway a classic it's at Sotheby's, that, like yeah, you they, do there's an, there's an article online about it and it's going for upwards of 45 million wow but from yeah, <laughs> for a viola, hey, which will, which right. make it they about, know it's not uh, a violin, right? Well, so well, you know, so, like there's violins all over. It's a violist. Yeah, yeah, right. And from what they from what they say, there's uh, this is one of ten existing Stradivarius violas, and I wow. didn't even realize that the, they were this rare. And so, and um, this one is supposed to be in pristine condition, and <laughs> yeah. So and it plays it too. Is that right? Sealed bit. Yeah, right. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. 
it's it unlike that's all extra. the other violas that it's, old... it's really just the instrument that's been the problem but this one is perfect so like get this viola and you'll be the best violist you know? right right <laughs> So I think I think that's the problem solved. That's what we do here. We are problem solvers at SoundNotion.tv. Yeah. Um, so get all your millions of dollars. Yeah, and I'm you know if you've got a, if you've got forty five million to spend on a viola, um, then maybe you were an anonymous donor that helped the Milwaukee Symphony get to where they need to be. Uh, yeah. Milwaukee, as as uh, you may know, had an a, a financial emergency they were going to have to uh sh- shorten their season right patrick um they were yes. threatening to shorten their season and, and basically uh shut down if they didn't if they didn't make this five million dollars they had a, t- a two million dollar budget shortfall um and they they raised five million dollars in a very short period of time to make up for that so they are they are uh, I wouldn't say that they're in great shape because they had to raise five million dollars in, in in a matter of weeks, but uh, they are at least in a position where they can finish the season and plan the next season. So, uh, congratulations to Milwaukee. Um, not too far away in Minnesota, which we've spent a lot of time the last two years talking about the Minnesota Orchestra. Uh, we we talked before about this fight between uh, Maestro Osmo Venska, who left last fall in, in kind of an ultimatum, said, if we're not playing soon, I got to go somewhere where I can conduct an orchestra because this sitting around hearing you guys bitch is not, not working for me. So <laughs> he he had to, he had to leave. Um, and, we, and it was really sad because he had just been nominated for a Grammy for the previous album of the Sibelius Cycle that he was doing with them. And their second album of that Sibelius Cycle won the Grammy this year. And there was all this talk of if they could get him back now that they're back playing. And he said, I would be willing to come back if CEO Michael Henson is not coming back. Uh, And so there was this kind of showdown between uh, Henson (laughs) and Vanska. And last week when we didn't have the show, because I, because I was at NASA, actually, is why we didn't have a show, um, and the, uh, there was the announcement two weeks ago that Henson was going to step down. He was going to step down, though not right away, which is weird. Um, so Henson is a lame duck. Uh, we also, that's a good, that's a good show title, by the way. That, yeah. um, <laughs> I, had, I had Stockhausen, you know, with everything. <laughs> that's pretty good, too. Um, so it was, we just found out this week that not only is Michael Henson going to, uh, leave, but over his resignation, I guess in protest, eight members of the board, uh, are also going to resign. So (laughs) some people might say that this is a loss, but I would say... Clearly something was wrong, and perhaps removing eight people from the board might fix the things that were wrong. Um, so if you are in the Minneapolis area and would like to be a member of an orchestra board, uh, there might be an Cause, opening for you. Because this is how it happens. You Start polishing your resume is what I'm saying. Right, right. I don't really exactly. know how it happens. I think you Update have to mostly CV have a bunch of money. Yeah. Uh, no, but you uh, fill out the application on the Minnesota Orchestra's website, right? Right. It's like a McDonald's <laughs> job. I want for you need a background check and most of a call of a high school diploma. Yeah, just fill in the web form. Right. Get a name tag with that gig? <laughs> yeah, it's a good gig, right? Yeah. I want to get a name tag with it though, you know? It's like, like <laughs> you gotta you gotta work there for three months before you get the name tag. Until yeah. then you just get the written one. That's right. Um yeah. Six and months, you get a little tote bag. It's great. Uh, right. And a whole year, year, you, you get, get business cards. <laughs> um, so, congratulations, I think, to the city of Minneapolis for getting rid of Michael Henson and some of the people who blew up your orchestra for two years. Um, things, are, things are looking up for, for you. Uh, things are not looking up, however, in San Diego, where the San Diego Opera is, is calling it quits. Um, I don't know if this is particularly surprising as we have... It is surprising. It's just out of nowhere? I guess it is kind of out of nowhere. But, I I mean, opera company closing is not surprising as a generic headline. San Diego, I guess, is what's surprising about it. At least for the years 2013 and 2014. Sure. Um, 
but I mean, yeah, we, I mean, we talked on, about they're... city opera. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's that's been talked about too much, right? I mean, but um, C- city opera kind of went out kicking and screaming, which is why we all talked about it, right? City opera uh, did, did not die did. gracefully the way San Diego seems to. Well, right. San Diego is basically it's it's kind of weird because the news is just basically, oh, by the way, um, we can't make it work. So hey, it's been nearly fifty years. We're shutting down, and that's it. Um, it's a lot I like what they, the Memphis Symphony Orchestra did, right? Except Memphis was more vague. We're like, mm-hmm. things are bad. We're winding down. <laughs> there was yeah. There's there's no really well. So the winding down here is they 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 were supposed to have a um a production of Albert Herring later this season. I, I think la- next month. But they're just going to finish up with um whatever opera. Uh, Massenet's Don Quixote. Yeah, a few more performances of that, and then that's it. Um, so it's unfortunate that they actually couldn't finish the thirteen fourteen season, the full thirteen fourteen season that they had envisioned. Um, but I guess that's the way it goes, right? And just a little bit of follow up to end. I mean, we're ending with all the bad news. This was poorly planned by me, uh, and by planned by me, planned by me is a bit of a stretch too, because that yeah. implies that there was a plan. Um, <laughs> Just a bit of follow-up from uh, a few weeks ago. We had Drew McManus of Adaptation.com on to talk about uh, the his his current Kickstarter project, his Open Orchestra 990 project, uh, which which was to pull together all the data from these these public financial records that orchestras around the country have to submit to uh, make a, a comparable, relatable database so we could get some really useful data uh, for, for people that observe the business, for people like him that are in the business, for uh, boards and for musicians when they're negotiating CBAs and things like that. Uh, if you're, this is a conversation you're interested in, you should check out that episode of Sound Notion. Um, but he was hoping to put together a Kickstarter that could fund the transfer of all of this information which is in rather opaque pdfs which are scattered all over the planet uh into a usable website that you could do useful things with the the, the data um so that kickstarter was not uh didn't meet its goal but i believe uh we're still going to see something come from that project but he- he used Kickstarter, so he had to make all the money to take any of the money. If he had used right. Indiegogo, I think he could set up a flexible plan sure, where and he we could can, get what he got. Yeah, the problem is if if you're proposing a thing that costs $40,000 to do and you don't get $40,000, people are still going to expect you to do the thing if they gave you their 25 or 50 bucks or whatever you want. So yeah, I understand yeah, why the, the barrier incentive. is there. But... <laughs> I think there are other things that we can do to make the data more useful without doing the the full Monty that the Drew had originally hoped for in uh, in in the Kickstarter proposal. Originally, we expect to see something on adaptation from Drew this week about what's going on. Uh, but follow that. We'll probably have uh, him on again. I'm sure that we will have him on again uh, at some point in the future to talk about what's going on in the orchestra world, and I'm sure the 990 Project will be a part of it. So follow him at adaptation.com for stuff about that. Um, is that. Do we have anything else? We got to... We, we've been... We're, we're going a little long, but not crazy. Yeah, um, well, uh, I think that's it. Let's play... Well, before we go... <laughs> See that? <laughs> you want one. You want one. They are available on the internet. Ooh. Uh, this is Joseph Klein's Improbable Encounters. Uh, Joe, do you have anything we've we, we left that we have not plugged that you would like to plug before we before we uh, sign off for the day? I think you guys did a great job. I, you even plugged things I didn't think you were going to know about, so that's ha. good. So <laughs> I would say on the album, lots of great soloists on there, not just in the pieces you mentioned, but the the solo pieces are. You know, some really stunning playing and uh, people like Thomas Block on the glass harmonica. You never get to hear the yeah, glass harmonica yeah. very much. And Helen Bledsoe, uh, you know, plays the hell out of the ocarina, which, again, another instrument you don't hear very well. So or hear very much in, in solo context, at least. So yeah. um, anyway, that's my last shameless plug on the CD. But thank you so much for having me. 
It's been it's been great talking to you. We've had a great time, and we'd love to. If you've got another big project coming up sometime, and and you want to talk about it, we would love to to talk about it with you, uh, and and share it with the audience. Because, and and, and as Joe pointed out, we spent a, a lot of time talking about one piece, and uh, not quite as much time talking about a second piece. But there there are two discs of really good stuff that that right. are definitely worth your time. Um, and we will have links to all the places where you can find those things on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, and also all of the news stories we talked about. And if you'd like to continue our conversation about the viability of operas and orchestras in the United States, or about intermedia, or about steampunk euphonium things, <laughs> we would love to continue those conversations anywhere that you like to have conversations on the internet. You can do leave, leave a comment on our site, soundnotion.tv. You can find us on Twitter. We're at soundnotion on Twitter. I'm at Dave McDow. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Nate is at a Nate Tree. Uh, and as, as a group, we're at Sound Notion. If you've got a story that you think you'd like us to discuss in a future episode of the show, tweet us with hashtag SN Weekly. And we always check that out as we're putting the show together. Like us on Facebook. And we post links there throughout the week, um, as well as to our, our wonderful content, but also to other interesting things that other people are doing. It's, it's, it's worth your follow. Subscribe to us on YouTube, where you'll see all of the, the shows that we do for Sound Notion and all the other shows that we have uh, on the network um, check out patch in about electronic music check out uh, streamers and punches about film music and check out our newly relaunched uh, audio show all the cool parts with anthony landman just d- had a, a really cool episode uh, go up this week as well so check those all out uh, on youtube and on our site we really appreciate it if you'd ever like to join us live we stream the show live at live.soundnotion.tv on sunday mornings around 11 a.m eastern time and we have a chat room open and you can participate in the conversation live as, as it's happening um so that's always fun as well if you'd like to support the show tell your friends that's the that's the best thing you can do if you really want to support the show next time you buy some stuff on amazon uh use the little search box on the right side of our site we get a a little commission it doesn't cost you anything extra but we get a little commission that helps us out a lot so thank you so much for watching or listening and we will see you back next week